Yes, it's another Wizard Foo live stream. For y'all on YouTube, this is going to be a pre recorded stream. I'll make it the game Load Ragger. It's five versus five. And today I'm working on continuing the gameplay mock up. The gameplay mock up is something very freeing. Helps me focus so much. I've never done this in a video game before. I've always just sort of created the game and created all the art as I went. And this time, I'm actually saving the art for after I get the gameplay finished. So I'm doing it with 2D mock-up sprites like this. The little circle represents the player right now, and those tree-like things are trees. Um, so, I'm going to continue on what I'm doing. Right now I've been working on uh, getting you, the player to be able to collide with the trees. Simple stuff like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this live stream and start coding and um, allow you, the viewer, to watch my process. This is my process. It's quite stumbly, but fun. Okay, so what I've did, done in this check-in is uh, I was like, why the heck is the player not able to touch the trees? He was like standing too far from the trees, and I was like, oh, his collision size is too big. Um, then I kind of optimized the collision system a little bit. I figured out that it was accidentally c caching all the collision objects twice. Dama Killer, what's up? How you doing today? And so that was a huge uh, optimization. I realized that the collision system is not taking into account anchor points. But that doesn't matter yet because the only anchor count that would actually change is the Z. And since we're doing a two-dimensional mock-up, the Z doesn't matter. Um, then a few more optimization bits. And um, yeah, and then starting to, this is giving the trees um, some collision sizes. Let's go ahead and actually give other stuff in systems some collision sizes too. And then we'll check all this in. And then we'll get to the point where we can start chopping down the trees, lumberjacking them. So that'll mean um, buying the lumberjack roll from the lumberjack building, getting a lumberjack axe, and going out and chopping down trees. Oh, really? DirectX C++ assignment? What's your What are you uh, caught on right now? What's What's causing uh, your problems and issue? Is it something I can help with? Even if it's some some guidance or some tips. I haven't done DirectX in a long time, though. I will mention that. But I kind of think I have the, the gist. Man, shoot, the last time I did DirectX was like 1996. Wow. That was like DirectX 1, I think, or... It might have been before they called it Direct... It was before they called it DirectX. I think it was just DirectDraw. I don't know. Man, that was a while ago. Shoot, I'm probably not the right person to ask about DirectX. But maybe is it... What is it? What's the issue, man? Okay, so that was giving that the trees some collision. Let's give the, uh, the lumberjack building some collision. Okay, and we also need a team. We need to set up what team this is currently. So um, let's, let's see. We want to test if AX, AX and AOI are the area X and Y. Oh, let's not worry about this just yet. You fish figured it out. Oh man. Uh huh. In ID three. Oh dang. Nice find, man. Nice find. Yep. For anybody watching on uh, YouTube or lurking or whatever, we're talking about this. This is creating an, an array of three integers. 
And he, uh, Diamond Killer wants four integers, so you just put a four there. Whoa, dang. That much proofreading, you're like, oh. I know what you mean, though. When you're putting together sort of a complex system and it's something you've never, maybe you have not that not that much experience with, it can be so easy to miss to overlook the simplest things because you're not that familiar with it yet. You're like, oh, but once you, yeah. Now that you've had the time though to like fix this, it'll be 10 times easier next time. Oh yeah, and it's C++ you're getting caught up with. Yeah. That's a big thing. Okay, so what I was just thinking there was eventually all these Team 1s need to become Team 2 if you're on the uh, the right half of the the arena. I almost said marina. <laughs> I got boats on the mine. Yeah. Comes back. When you've been working in a different language, and then you switch back to a language... It all depends on how familiar you are with all those languages anyways. But yeah, I know I know that feeling. Switching back to a language. Lodestone needs a bit of collision size. Um, cave entrance. Already does. The river. Rivers do. This is neutral though. Uh, here's some more water. That's also neutral. Okay, now the underworld entities, like the center pit here, that is just water, so we'll keep that as neutral. And then rocks. These are T1 for now. No, no, wait, new. All rocks are neutral. Okay. What's that? It all works now. Yes! Yes, dude! Oh! I am so honored and happy for you. I'm honored to be here in this moment where you fixed a, a crazy bug you've been trying to track forever. Oh, man. Celebration moment. Oh, I wish I had, like, confetti I could just throw on the screen right now. Or some kind of like fireworks. I need like a hotkey that just does fireworks. So whenever I'm streaming and something awesome happens, fireworks or something else fun. Okay, let's see if those entities now are all physical with collision boxes. I'm trying to avoid doing an entire collision drawing system. That's what I did for Songbringer. I did little red uh, entities around, or red. Yeah, this is running real slow. Lots of optimization that can be done here. But that's okay. We are colliding, I think, with these entities. This is, shoot, I, I need to really improve the performance. Yeah, it's colliding with that. Sure is nice to focus entirely on gameplay. Focus on something actually that's really easy is is just amazing right now. I was working on difficult stuff with uh, voxels for a while. It's nice to set that burden down for a minute. Come back to it later with a fully working gameplay system. All right, cool. So I was I was testing that out. We are able to collide with the rocks, collide with that kind of stuff. Slight setback. I know what you mean, man. But you know what? You've broken through. You've broken through, man. And now you understand so much more. You understand what stopped you and how you got past that. Okay, let's go ahead and check us in. Okay, this is basically... Add collision sizes for 
trees, rocks, etc. Next up, um, I was just noticing while in there that the pathfinding isn't quite working how it could, um, how it should, I mean. So let's do that. Let's make the move system work better. The move system, I think what's wrong with it is that it's not updating its last east-west versus north-south direction. Last east. So... this move system tick no this, this can't be this is the old move system tick I don't know how I have all this old code still just sitting here hey in fact maybe I should just take all this out copy this over from songbringer as needed yeah let's do that this is confusing I mean so much code not being used at all it's easy enough to just open up Songbringer's CPP file and copy over a function if I need it to adapt it for load dragger. Let's get rid of all that. I think Collision System also has something like some stuff like that in it. Yeah, let's simplify these files. It helps because when you're doing like a find in all files and you're looking for something specific, like I don't know, some very some accessing some variable. What functions access this certain variable? And then you got all this dead code that's not being used. It finds all these false positives for your search, basically, and that can slow you down as a programmer. So it might as well just get rid of the stuff you're not using. Especially when it's somewhere else, convenient, waiting for you whenever you need. It's good to be able to reuse code from previous games. I mean, god dang, Songbringer was like 125,000 lines. Might as well reuse a few of them. And I have, so far, I have. I certainly have. I used a lot. Is this, uh,. Shoot. Dang, this is a lot of a lot of stuff. There it is. Whew, man, it was a lot. Let's get rid of all that for sure. Okay, let's make sure we can recompile. Didn't accidentally put a bug in here or something by doing that. Man, I had a good time with family this weekend. Thanksgiving. Cool. All right, we're back to where we were. Right? You had to exercise. Whoa, a plane using offsets, rotations, and matrices? Ah, now you're component, uh, making a hierarchical component class tree for the for the plane oh dang so do you have enough time to finish it before it's due oh well, see that's exactly what I'm talking about if I go now I can go last east west direction and there I only have it in a couple places ah okay so, here's one reason why last east-west direction was not even working, because it's not even being applied. Let's go ahead and put that back in. Oh, doing the same for a robot and making him animate? Whoa! 
Dang, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. You're not only doing basic direct egg stuff, but you're doing all this other matrices and rotations and and then animations too. Yeah, man, that's that's totally intense. That's a lot of work. How much did, how much time did they allot you for that whole project? Cuz that's it's quite a want. Yeah, final year. Okay, and now it's starting to make more sense if it's final year stuff. Last, oh, do I not even have a last east-west direction? Hold on a second. Move component. Oh, it's last, I have a last x sign now. Okay, that's even better. Last X sign. Last Y sign. Okay, so this is why do I need the one over move system Y factor? Oh, that was for Songbringer. Don't need that. There we go. Much better. That's abs F V Y. Whoa, that's weird. Oh, about a month. Yeah. Oh, dang. Abs F V Y. Last X sign. Wait, was that last X sign? Oh yeah, that was that's right. Okay. Wow, maybe I should have that commented out still. Just so I can refer to that at a glance. Okay, that's better. I guess we don't need those anymore. Virtual exist. Hey, hey. What I'm working on right now is gameplay mock-up in 2D. So this is Low Dragger, five versus five creative game, and uh, it's going to be 3D voxels. You, 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 we were talking the other day. You already know all this, but I'm just repeating it. In case anybody else is curious, um, yeah. So it's gonna be a 3D voxel game, but I got really distracted there for a minute working on the 3D voxel system, working way too long on it, and I decided to make a two-dimensional gameplay mock-up with just super cheesy sprites, so that I can focus entirely on the gameplay. It's something I've never done before in all my years of game development. Um, I've never, I've never purely created gameplay without working at all on art and this is a really gosh it's awesome like it's really freeing like i feel like um uh, oh, i just feel like so easily able to focus because my tendency at uh, being an artist and a programmer and a musician was with this making games is that i tend to get distracted by the art and focus on it a little bit too much when the gameplay hasn't even evolved yet. And when the gameplay it hasn't evolved yet and you're sort of working on art, you tend to like waste a lot of time. There's a lot of wasted inefficiencies that go along with that. So I'm really excited to just nail down the gameplay. Um, let me show you what I'm talking about. Just nail down this gameplay and then, and then start throwing in the art and uh, making it look good. Uh, and what's what's also kind of interesting about this philosophy is I'm not even focusing on frame rate issues at all. I'm just trying to get the gameplay working. You can notice I'm running at five, four frames a second right now. Super duper inefficient, slow code. That's because I'm drawing like 4,000 sprites or something like that. I'm drawing the entire arena's worth of sprites 
So it's just like tanking the FPS. But who cares? Just focus on gameplay. Oh, hey. Oh, is it working now? Hold on a second. Okay, so we've got... The last X direction I moved was right. Wait, hold on. Let's get to over here. Okay, last X direction was right. If I go straight up, pathfinding should move me to the right. Okay, it is. Good. Now if I go... This is my last X direction is now to the left. If I go straight up... It moves me to the left! Oh, sweet. I'm glad that that was a simple fix. It will be 3D, yes. This game will be totally 3D, voxel. I'm just doing the 2D mock-up. Yeah. So once this two once this once I've got the mock-up finished and the gameplay is all tight, I'll start make working on all the 3D models and, and stuff like that. Bring this game back into its its 3D-ness. Hmm. Let's go ahead and check this in separately. So that's what I want to keep. Okay, so remove, remove, let's say remove large commented sections of move system and collision system. And then redo all this stuff. Well. Yeah, I am I'm coding in C. Um and yeah, I decided uh, I decided to stick with C after some debate. Um, I actually considered making this game in C instead of C because I assumed that C was faster than C in all in all ways. And um, I found out the C++ can compile just about as fast as C, or negligible, negligible differences between their compilation speeds, as long as you're not using templates too much. And if you're using any of the STL, especially things like String, or IO Stream, or any of those other C++ things that have so many template arguments for their templates that it's like, pollutes your namespace and goes crazy on the compiler because the compiler has to compile tons of functions just to get a simple string constructor. Man, so as long as you're not using templates too much, pretty much the STL, uh, and you're writing all your own stuff, like write your own string class, write your own map class, write your own vector class, C++ can be really fast to compile. So I'm sticking with it for now. I would use Jonathan Blow's um, Jai language. I can't wait for that, but it isn't finished yet, and it isn't ready for game development. And I don't quite have the time to do the beta for it, so I've got to make this game. Okay, let's make sure that Pathfind still works, because I did. I am checking this in as two separate check-ins. So what I just coded might have changed. The next thing we need to do is make it so you can buy the lumberjack axe. Okay, move to the right up there, moves me to the right. Okay, now I move to the left, move over here, moves me to the left. Okay, sweet. Last X sign. Where does that actually set it? Oh, it just sets it right here. Okay. Nice.
No, the graphics are not made through code. I'm actually just, I just drew all these sprites in, um, in here in um, Photoshop. So I just got all these placeholder sprites I drew. You know, that represents the knight. This represents Rollis. This represents the lumberjack. This is the builder, etc. That's a ghost. <laughs> Just cheesy sprites, man. Mock it up the gameplay. Uh, no, I do not use Unity or Unreal or any type of uh, software-based game development. I prefer to have access to the pure source code and edit it all from the command line because I find it to be much faster <clears throat> once you got it all set up, of course. Uh, the placement, yeah, yeah, the placement of every sprite is done in code. Yep, so if you, let me show you what I'm talking about. There's a function which creates entities. This is creating underworld entities, and it gives me all these variables on its X and Y position in the world. And it just goes and says, oh, if we're at that position, then create one of these entities. If we're at this other thing, maybe create a pathway. And so yeah, it's it's all done in code, how it places everything there in the arena. God dang. Telemarketers, man. Telemark how did they get my number? It's like telemarketers these days call you from a number that looks familiar too. You're like, whoa, hey, somebody called me from 541. That's my area code. Must be somebody I know. Nope. It's a telemarker. Okay, so we've got that. We got movement. We've got all the entities able to collide with them. Everything's running slowly, but that's okay. Okay, so now we need to be able to go stand next to the um, stand next to the lumberjack building, press a button, and we become a lumberjack. Uh, and it costs gold. Uh, no, it's our uh, Visual Basic is a is not you know too bad of a language to start with. I actually I actually did Visual Basic for a little while, back in the day. It's good to learn any language, really. So what what about it scares you? How about we skip the part about the player? becoming a lumberjack for now. We'll just start the player as a lumberjack and we'll start implementing those mechanics because I want to skip to that. It's fun skipping around. Okay, so that means we want the player to be the axe icon. And we'll just make him so he can swing his axe. Enko, what's up brother? Great to see you. Great to see you too. How you been? Okay, where did I put those? Uh, this is all in art sheets. Common. There we go. Okay, so I want the lumberjack icon. It's that one. Placeholders one. Okay, so the player is gonna start as placeholders one, and we're just gonna implement some mechanics. Or chop it down trees. Uh, create the player. Create the player. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Ah, uh, there it is. Oh, it's all in player. Dot. That's right. Okay. So for now, player, you are players holders. Placeholders one. Doing really simple programs on Python or C++ for hardware. Oh, it seems hard? Oh, I got you, man. After a while, it won't seem so hard. It really just takes time to become familiar with the language and also time to become familiar with whatever platform you're working on. So if you're working with Arduino, 
you get, it's going to take time to get used to that. And also C++ itself is its own topic that will take time to get used to. But once you get used to it, man, it won't seem hard anymore. It'll seem easier. Kosash, what's, brother, what's up? Is it a new game? Yes. Did I move from our previous home? Yes. Yep. This is a new game. It's uh, it's called Load Ragger, and it is five on five creative multiplayer. Uh, by creative, I mean that you can change your role at runtime, so you can be like a lumberjack, a builder, a knight, an archer, etc. And uh, and also what I mean by creative is that you can carve out your lanes. So each of the arenas is full of trees. You can chop down the trees to carve out the lanes each match. And another thing is that you can build buildings. Nice, man. Site building. Cool. I hear you, man, on the ups and downs. Same here. Yeah, it takes time for things to feel natural and easy. Five versus five, isn't it too much? Haha. <laughs> no, it's not. I've done a I've done a five on five multiplayer game before. Actually, it was a four on four. But uh, yeah, I've done this before. I know how to do multiplayer games. It's not too much. Um, thankfully, not too much. I have experience in this before. Okay, so since we're now the lumberjack role, we need to be able to get, to be able to swing an axe and create, I guess we have to create some kind of entity which damages another entity temporarily for a short time. It gets deleted after a second and that entity can chop down trees. Okay, it's gonna take a, it's gonna take a bit of wizardry Right, yeah. Yeah. We're not used to tweaking software and stuff ourselves. Well, all you got to do is get used to it, man. Learn some assembly. Learn some lower level code. If that's what you want to do. If you really want to do Arduino stuff and Raspberry Pi. You got to get used to that lower level stuff or how how the how the software interacts with that hardware. It's just like uh just like learning C++, it's just one more little thing to learn and become familiar with. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to drop an entity. Let's create this entity real quick. It's, um, let's go to data, copy the player for now, it's not really what, whatever, player, we'll call this, um, I guess we're going to call this axe. Okay, and the axe, the axe uses the swipe animation. There it is. Placeholder's 18. Can't move. Only has a collision. 20 by 12 is okay. That's player category. And what it hits, oh. Hmm. This is like, okay, so we're looking at the collision system now and how it interacts with entities. Um, the collision system I wrote for Songbringer um, used a method where every entity had a category and a mask. The category was like, for example, player. It's the player category means that that 
entity as a player. Maybe it would have an, um, I don't know, like a a rock category or whatever, a tree category. And then the mask is whatever that entity collides with or is colliding with. So we're going to have to do dance. Whoa, this is where we're going to get the health system. Ah. Oh. It's health system time. Okay, because this entity needs to damage other entities. So damage. Uh, I have no idea what to, what to call this. Let's just call this damage four. <laughs> um, and this collides with neutral arena. Okay, so collision components need to have damage. I'm not sure if they do yet. They do not. Okay, so we've got int damage, original damage, damage dealt. I think that was damage dealt per tick. Okay, and damage, original damage, damage dealt. Let's start it off without the damage dealt. Okay, so collision component. We're also gonna need a health component. I'm not sure if I added that yet, I hope so. Okay, and we need to load the damage from the data. And we'll call this, uh, this is math. Parse I S might need math. Okay, we do include kit math. Okay, there we're loading damage. Hey, great to see you too. I hear you on the sleep. All right, we'll see you later. Good luck with everything. Oh, we got some more dead code here I don't need. Okay. I think we have a health component. Yes, I did the health component. Nice. Oh, we got the basics. We just got HP, max HP. Great. Health component dot CPP. Oh, we didn't set it up though. HP zero. Max HP zero. Okay. And we can parse it. There's some stuff we don't need. More dead code. Pull that when I need it. Okay, so we've got a health component that has hit points and max hit points. We've got a collision component that has damage now. So basically we need to now create a, the uh, some, first of all, we need to you know give the entities health then we need to give some entity entities damage, 
and we need to um, make it so that the collision system looks through and looks for collisions between entities that would damage each other and then applies that damage. Okay. So the player needs hit points. The trees need hit points. Let's just start with the trees having hit points. Turticus! What's up, Burgicus? Trees. That's one of the overworld entities. Centipede River Cave. Oh, Tree's the last one. Alright, Tree. We're gonna give you health. Health.hp. Let's say this tree has... Eight hit points. Okay. Let's go ahead and set a breakpoint in health component to see if that works. Oh, one thing. We may not even be creating health components yet. Wow, we're not. Okay, we need to create health components, that's for sure. Oh, what else do we need to do here? We need a health component, Sid. Yeah, it's going to be a multiplayer game. Five on five, real time. I don't think we're including health component yet. We probably need to go to int.h. Add that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, we need health component in int.h. And uh, we need to add a health component to each int. We need to be able to get health. And um, that's uh, that's it for now. Okay, so now in int.cpp, we need to look for all the health components. Start name, start enabling all this. Okay, we're, we're loading the health component. We've got it as SID for it. We can assert. And we can get the health component. That should be it. Okay, this should be compilable now. And we'll go to where it's load where it actually loads the health component. We'll set a breakpoint there just to make sure that this thing is actually getting created or the health component is getting created for the tree. And oh, we've already got a breakpoint there. Okay. Let's just run this. Did that wait, did that compile? Successfully compiled. Wow. Okay, so we're running this to check if the hit points load from data. All right, we did not get a breakpoint there. Dang. Okay. What happened? First of all, is it getting... Oh, where is that? And create. I don't think I, I saw that. Ant.cpp has a function called create. That's clear. There it is. Okay, we did not create the health component. Didn't even try. Health component. It's called health. Okay, let's give that a compile. We'll rerun it. Same breakpoint.
Nice. Cool. So we're in the bit here where we're creating an overworld entity. This is one of the trees. It has a health component with hit points 8. And we are now parsing the string 8. So that should work fine. We can step over that. And we do have hit points 8, max hit points 8. All right, cool. We now have health components. That means that any entity now can have hit points as part of their health component. And eventually the health component will have lots of other stuff in it that applies to health. Okay, so now that we have a health component, we've confirmed that it loads, and we've given all the trees health components. Um, I guess we could do collit. We could actually do damage with the health system, or we could do damage with the collision system. So, am I going to look at it from the perspective that an entity is colliding and thus, therefore, it damages stuff, which I did. I did that way with Songbringer. Or do I want to make it so that the health system checks that? Oh, hey, now that I'm at this position, let me check and see if I should be damaged. Hmm. Well, I guess it would be far more efficient if whenever you moved an entity, it would then check if it's now in a position to damage other entities. Because that would create a check only once when you move the health, the entity in the first place. Yes, it could come from many sources at, at once. Tied to the collision component. That's, yeah, that's how it was. It's Songbringer. I see the reasoning there. I wonder if it's possible, though, to whenever I just, whenever I move an entity, to then go and check, and, and, it, and that entity is one that would damage other, no, wait. I guess it would have to be whenever I create or move an entity because sometimes you want to create an entity that doesn't move that damages stuff. So I, I think that could work. So for example, I create a tiny little entity representing an axe swing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This damage calculation will run server side. This is a this is a client server game. Um, there'll probably be some kind of peer to peer mode, like maybe over Bluetooth or maybe just I don't know exactly what kind of peer to peer to peer mode it will be. But uh, the last game I wrote that was multiplayer was peer to peer entirely, and it was difficult to um, create a sense of fairness. Because I had one entity that one player, sorry, that was the host, and so their their device or computer or whatever was the one that decided whether something counted or not, and so that wasn't always fair, you know. Actually, a lot of the time it wasn't fair. It basically meant that the host player always had a really so like a smooth experience. There, they didn't have to wait for delays. They didn't have to wait for any kind of latency, for example. Um, and uh, every other but every other player had a less fair situation. So client server is, is a simple way to fix that. I was always thinking maybe in the future if I did do a peer to peer game again, maybe the host could rotate, like you know, for one for a hundred ticks, um, this player is the host. The next hundred ticks, that player is the host. I don't know, but you need some kind of authority. You need you need somewhere if you don't have a if you don't have a server. You need someone to be the authority on, um, like, situations where entities get desynchronized. Um, because that happens a lot. You get a ton of drop packets. You have latency. You have packets arriving in the wrong order sometimes. Um, and all that stuff leads to tricky challenges for the game to deal with.
um, that require some kind of authority. So, but anyways, totally off on a tangent there. Um, we're now just we're now considering making collision components. Okay, let's just do it the simple way for now, which is where a collision the collision system checks for all damages, just like Songbringer did. That worked fine. I guess I can make this more optimal later if I want, and consider the fact of maybe only doing collision damage checks when an entity moves or an entity is created. So for now though, we'll just do it in the collision system just to get this code out there, and get this so I can play it, and try it out. All right, so the collision system, this whole this is getting really too much code open. I'm just closing that, reopening them so I can just go to, straight to collision system and have like one file open. All right, collision system. Right now, it's looping over and determining. This is a this is determine. Uh, well, let's just call this step on exits. Okay, we need to loop over all entities which have a collision basically just all entities that have collision damage let's do that Okay, so we're looping over all collision components. There are a ton of them. So I'm gonna do a quick check if this is faster than creating an ent is a nice convenient way to represent an entity with a lot of different components, but it can be a bit time consuming to create thousands of them. So I'm doing one simple check where we do entity get collision component. Uh, for this id, if it has damage, oops, continue. There, now we have a little bit more of an efficient system here. Now we can create an id. Now we know that from here on, this entity has a damage. So now we need to check if this entity is colliding with any other entity this is not the most this is not the most perfect way to do it because we're only getting one entity per collision we should technically have a, a vector of ids and load all the collisions that this entity is colliding with and apply damage to all of them but for now we'll just do a simple thing where we just do one entity and damage it so what we're looking for is the mask we're looking for here is eta collision dot mask. So this particular entity that has the damage is looking for all of the entities that match its mask at its current position with its current collision size. All right. So we're now if we have a match. Then we apply damage. We'll call this ant F because it's the next letter after E. And we'll do ant F SID. Now if F dot health, we need to make sure that the health component has a good operator bool. Good. So if their max hit points is greater than zero, that's a healthy health component. Haha. <laughs> Um, so that's what I'm doing right there. That is um, calling the operator bool. If you didn't know that about C++, you can create your own operators. And one of them is this thing where you're just, it's implicitly converting this to a Boolean. And that's why it, uh, that's why it's calling that function. 
No piercing entities? Hmm. All right, so if this has a health component and the entity is colliding with it, then... Okay, we're going to do the simple thing here. We're just going to subtract the hit points right now. So f.health.hp minus equals... Now we'll do equals math clamp I zero. I don't think we have math. Let's get some math headered up here. Clamp Y zero. Val F dot health dot HP minus um, E dot collision dot damage. And there you go. Okay, we do need to delete an entity here. Okay, so we are about to delete an entity for the first time. Um, this is also another thing that I did a certain way with Songbringer, but I'd like to take a step back and consider maybe some other other ways of doing it. So Songbringer, what I did for deleting an entity, since you're mutating the array that you're currently looping over at some point, you're looping over entities to to do this, right? Um, and you're you by deleting that entity, you're for example, if you're looping over collision components and you delete an entity right then, then you would have one less collision component possibly, and that mutates your array that you're looping over, and uh, this kind of is a bad thing. Uh, one thing you can do is basically just make a copy of that huge array of components, but that can be super inefficient if you um, have a lot of those components, which this does have thousands of different trees already. So, um, so the solution for Songbringer was to basically push back a function that um, uh, would run after the tick that would delete the entity. So, um, but I'm thinking that maybe, maybe there's a, a, a vector of entities that need to be deleted, and that just happens once at the end of the tick. Right, yeah, yeah. That's one way to do it too. But um, what that does is it adds complexity to every one of the loops that I do. So this is right now, this is a very simple thing. I can just loop over that easily, right? But if I were to do this, where I, I made, did a, a range-based for loop for, um, or if I, if I used a regular, uh, you know, iterator that I increment as needed, what happens is you it would create complexity when I go delete the entities, like for example, uh, if I'm going to delete this entity, then I have to increment the iterator, and um, if not, I don't increment the iterator. It basically creates a lot of complexity inside all these loops and at the top of the loop when you're when you're doing it. And this happens in many many different systems throughout the whole game. Um, so it's it's better to have a simpler solution that makes it easier um, to loop. And I like so I like I like being I like it the way it is where it deletes entities after the tick. I guess it's just more of should I delete the entities um, with a function that's pushed back or with a, just a list of entities that need to be deleted? I think I'm just going to do a list of entities for now. It seems simpler. So we'll go ahead and add that to. Ooh, I guess systems. Systems is a good place for that. Systems H. Gosh, I gotta get. There's just one little bug I keep dealing with. I have this really neat thing where I can load. I can load up. I can search for things quickly and find anything I'm looking for. And one of the things I like to look for is uh, source files. So maybe if I want to load um, systems.cpp. Um, I typically have an entry for that, but whenever I save a file, it removes it from the list. I gotta remember how to freaking fix that. I 
fix that because I switched to NVim. I switched from Vim to NVim a few months ago, and there's still a few little things I gotta dial in. Okay, so for now I just load the file a different way. Source systems. Okay, so let's do source systems.h as well. And we'll make a function just called delete entity. We probably want another one that's delete entity after a certain amount of time. Oh man, this should, I guess this shouldn't be systems. This should be delete. This should be an ent. And since we have create methods, let's call it destroy. So we've got destroy and destroy after a number of seconds delay. Have I ever used standard async? No, what is that? I've never heard of standard async. I imagine that's a... I'm uh, One of the things I'm trying to do is not use this STL at all much in this game. Let's check this out. What is it? Might as well know. I prefer C++.com. Oh, it creates threads. Okay. Yeah, it gives you a future object so you can wait for it, check on its status and all that. I get you. Interesting. It's good to know. <coughs> Whoa, excuse me. Oh, we need one more. Call this tick, tick destroy. Tick destroy will work. All right. So whenever we destroy. We're going to keep a static list of Oh, this needs to be a map actually. Yeah, it is useful. How come I want to re reduce use on it? 
I did a whole video about this. Um, it's uh, I considered writing this entire game in C um, because I was under the assumption that C++ compiled slower than C. And uh, I found out through some tests, test projects basically, that C++ can compile negligibly, in, like no, almost no difference in its compilation speed, as long as you're not using templates too much. Templates can really complexify all the code that a compiler has to compile, and it can't really optimize that because you can't, because um, templates are something you can't really, you can't really compile into a library and reuse. You have to, you have to like have every single compilation unit do some work to apply the usage of that template. Um, so, uh, so basically, templates really slow down C++ compilation. And I wanted to have a super fast compiling game this time, so I could I could develop a little bit faster. I'm, I was tired of Songbringer compiling slowly. When I did a recompile of Songbringer, it was something like 70 seconds or something like that. Welcome back, Dami. And uh, so this is so I've actually gotten this game to compile so much faster, like per compilation unit. We're talking like 500% faster compilation just by removing string stuff like that so I'm trying to use uh, I'm trying to use forward declarations as much as possible reduce all usage on the STL if possible um, in fact I still use STL but only in certain cases and never in header files so especially in header files removing all sorts of uh, interdependencies and things like that it's really really sped up compilation time so I'll keep a map Ian and this is the unsigned is the number of ticks until it gets destroyed. Uh, you mean a precompiled header? Uh, yes, I do on um, Windows builds um, and also on Mac builds. Mac builds don't use uh, standard FX. Yep. Okay, we'll call this tick destroy. All right, so when an entity gets destroyed, right now, it gets pushed back. With a zero ticks delay. When an entity gets destroyed after delay, then it is delay over C ticks. Wait a second. Tick dot H. Oh yeah, there it is. Why isn't that? Oh, maybe because I don't have tick here. Ah, we need tick. All right, C ticks per sec. Is it C ticks per second? No, it's delay over C seconds per tick. And that all needs to be, uh, let's do seal F on that, or just seal. We need math. Did I spell seal wrong? C standard line, maybe? Okay, I think we need C standard lab here. 
I maybe I should put that part of math dot h. Aye. Aye, caramba. There's this bug in Xcode where it doesn't show you the errors. It's not C standard live. What is it? Oh, is it C math? Yeah, it is. Good call. C math. Why don't I have, I thought I had C math included from math.h. I had C limits. Yeah, we need C math as well. Oh, were you you had Visual Studio issues where you was getting slowdowns? Were you and you were you running Visual Studio from the USB or was it just that the USB was plugged in? Oh, am I spelling it wrong? To it, it I am spelling it wrong. Okay, so when we do tick destroy, we're just going to loop over all entities. That are in the destroy list. And this is one where we're going to actually use a not range range based for loop. Oh, you're running the project from it. Oh, right. Yeah. I, I understand. That's handy to not have to worry about it. You know, like, oh, did I did I copy that to my desktop? So we're gonna loop over all destroy ids. And okay, so we take um If it second equals zero, this is where we destroy the entity and we delete the, or we, yeah, we go destroy is, wait, wait, it equals destroy is dot erase. Key is it first. No, destroy just it. Can we do that? I think so. Otherwise, increment. Now we do the actual destroying of entities. How the heck do I do this again? I guess I just remove all the components. Shoot, it's been a minute. Let's go over Songbringer's code. I think I had area delete entity. It's because area is kind of owned entities in this game. Entities, oh yeah, and there was the entities array. Ret, ret, and destroy, and destroy now. There it is.
So it's a lot of work for this. But really, it's just calling entity destroyed now. Okay, and now we need to go to systems. And, uh, oh, just tick all. It's the function we're looking for. All right. We've got int, destroy, tick destroy. Okay, that was, that was a lengthy bit of coding. Let's hope this all works. Um, what should we, uh, we want to destroy, oh, we were back in collision system. That's right, if an entity Actually, it should be health system. I'm just going to accommodate that for that way. This belongs in health system for now, but I don't have a health system created yet. So, but if f.health.hp is now zero, then int destroy f.id. I'll destroy it right now, this tick. Okay, and something simple to get this, to be able to test this, I'm gonna go and edit the player. So the player actually damages stuff. And let's go and uh, make it so the player can walk on the arena stuff and the player damages stuff. Okay. There. I think we have something now where we can test this out. So we want a, a breakpoint in collision system. Oh, right, here we go. One breakpoint right there. If an entity damages another entity, Nice. We got this breakpoint. Ah. Okay, so this tree should be a tree. Um, oh, it's its health. Has eight hit points currently. Oh, it needs an invincible duration. It's going to immediately kill it because the very next tick, it's going to go ahead and subtract from its hit points again. So that was what I did for Songbringer. Um, I made every entity, when it got damaged, it suddenly had an invincible duration, right? It was invincible for a half a second for example and uh, that prevented it from getting damaged instantly just killed so what we need to do that basically add uh, an invincible duration to each health component and if the health component um, is invincible then it can't be damaged it's nice to be stepping back from how I did things with Songbringer and trying to make each system now 
function a little bit more independently. What I was accidentally doing, or you could say naively doing with Songbringer was was a hidden a thing called hidden messaging where a for example if the collision system noticed that an entity needed to be damaged then it would da do the damage for the health health system and maybe set a flag so that something else would happen in the health system later and that's called hidden messaging because uh, a system is modifying the data for another system and then sort of setting a flag or whatever to allow, to allow that other system to be aware of it it's not it's not the simplest way to do it it's, there's a there's a purer way to approach that so hopefully I can I can achieve that here with load ragger to have simpler systems that are all sort of self-contained and modular and there's nothing really sneakily modifying another system okay so that entity is still alive but next tick it's not there we go. We're going and destroy. We're pushing back this, and we want to now. We want to set a breakpoint there. So let's check the destroy eids after it's um, added one of them. So let's open up this map, and it looks like. Whoa! Really? Okay, it worked. That was really weird. It wasn't displaying its data correctly up there. All right, it, it's oh, we needed to subtract. Shoot, that delay is that delayed destroy is not going to work. But luckily, this destroy now is working. So if it's second equals zero, otherwise it's second minus minus. So now we're going to call entity destroy now. It removes all its components, removes it from the entities array. Oh no! Trying to delete a position component. It's dying or it's crashing. Why is it crashing on position component destructor? This would probably be the first SID. Yeah, this is SID zero. Ooh, it does not like deleting that position component. Why is that? Looks like a fine thing to be deleted. Huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, is it, you know, but it's got to, see, it's got to, it's got to find, its pointer is fine. What did I do wrong here? I mean, I do have a flag. Yeah, there's a check for null there. Huh. Well, this is the first entity I've ever tried to delete in this game so far. I'm using the entity component system from Songbringer without too many changes yet. There are some optimizations I want to do to this entity component system, but I'm kind of baffled as to why it's crashing right here. Um, I mean, we're not inside of any kind of we're not inside of any kind of loop over components. Huh. Okay, let's go ahead and just set a breakpoint right here, right before it it does this and see what we can figure out.
So if you're just tuning into this this uh, video on YouTube or this live stream right now on Twitch, I'm trying to figure out. Um, I'm trying to make it so right now the character I am is this axe, and I'm trying to chop down a tree just by simply stepping on it. And I'll by stepping on it, I'll damage the tree and and then delete it. And uh, the entity when it gets to be deleted, it it's crashing. Okay, we we know about that breakpoint. Whoops. There we go. Okay. Tick destroy. And you destroy now. Okay, it definitely hasn't crashed before this. And I can see that the pointer the the posi pointer to the position component is <gasps> Oh, I know what it is. Okay, I totally know what it is. Um, this is kind of neat, actually. This is an optimization I did for Load Dragger for the Entity Component System. So, um, what happens with what happens with CPUs these days is that you, if you have data that for an entity, for example, that's all close to each other in memory, it's more efficient for the CPU because the CPU doesn't have to any cache misses. So it can cache up all of the data for a single entity onto its L1 or L2 cache. I don't know what kind of cache it is exactly on the CPU, but um, it can cache that up. And if it misses the cache, it slows things down a lot. It has to go. So if you have your components in memory and say your position component is way over here in memory and your collision component is way over there in memory, you're going to get collision cache misses and it's going to have to load the data over here. And it's going to have to load data over there, and now all of a sudden your algorithm is much slower. So the um, the optimization I made was to allocate a buffer for all components right here in this ent.cpp, and then when it goes to create a component, instead of newing it off of the heap, it news it from that super sweet buffer, so everything is all right in the same contiguous bit of memory especially for the same entity, the same entity is going to have all of its memory right there. Boom. Same spot. So what was happening there was I was deleting um, something that I didn't create on the heap. So I need a better dis entity destroy now. I need to, I need to upgrade this because I need to be able to handle the fact that an entity might be created from the stack, or it might be created from the de the entity data buffer. Uh, I guess for now, the simplest thing to do is to com comment out that delete in entity foo. Well, this is all in. This is in remove component. Okay, I need to. Th I need to think about this for a while. Like, how do I actually delete entities properly? Um, for example, an entity might need to somehow have a flag that it knows. It knows that this entity ha um, was uh, located from the buffer and not the heap. And therefore, when it deletes its component or removes its component, it's not going to delete the pointer. It only would call, it does need to call pointer. It needs to call its destructor. And we don't know, shoot, we don't know what that. We do that. We can't do that. We need to know what class this is somehow. Okay, so I do need to think about this a lot. How do I do that? So no destructors are going to get called right now. Okay, let's just see if this does not crash.
Okay, so I'm moving up here near the trees. Oh, it's not working. Oh, I can see why. It's not delete. It's not even deleting the uh, the render component. So, or it's not calling the render components destructor. Hmm. Now we got a tricky situation here. But at least I know what's going on. Huh. Uh, so I need to figure out a way to to call the destructor. Gosh, I wish there was some way to know if a certain bit of memory was created off the heap. Oh, shoot, I guess I could just look at the pointer and see if it falls in the range of the buffer. No, I am not, Turticus. That's a very, very good point. Very, very excellent point to bring up. Um, I don't know if it's going to be actually slower because it's in a different page or location of memory. Um, uh, so for y'all watching this somewhere else or lurking or whatever, what we're talking about here is profiling. Profiling is something where you can actually confirm that something is actually slower. Um, I'm not even sure how you would profile that though. Right. Yeah. Huh. I guess I'm assuming that this is faster by a location. You know what? It probably is. It's, it's a good chance this is, this is faster because it doesn't have to call operator new or locate anything from the stack. It only has to locate the memory once. And, um, so yeah, there's there's another there's another performance benefit. There's two benefits. There's one when you're actually newing the data, you don't have to call new, or you're just calling placement new, which is much more fast than uh, the heap new. Um, so there's more benefits than just the L. Than just cache misses. Okay, we just need to delete. We just need to call the destructors. I guess one stupid way I could do it would be when we go to actually delete an entity. Instead of calling entity destroy now, we could call all the destructors. I guess we would have to loop over the, all the SIDs. Huh. Wait. Wait, is that how? I use placement new in simple. And I use yeah, you have to you have to explicitly call destructors when you use placement new. And you aren't you don't ever call delete with placement new. Okay, I remember that. Okay, it's, oh man, this is a tricky situation. I could just go, I could brute force this and just say, like, um, if we have a health component and the health component's pointer is inside the buffer, then then call the destructor. But then entity entity foo would have to be reworked somehow with its deletes.
standard unique pointer. I pro I should probably should be using those. To be honest, I don't even really understand them that much. Or I mean, I understand the concept. I just haven't ever used them. It's probably a bad thing. I probably do need to use those. Huh. Yeah, let's let's just research that real quick. Could this actually solve my issue? Okay, right, so unique pointer basically becomes responsible for deleting So it has a stored pointer and a stored deleter. Right, if it goes out of scope, it's automatically deleted, yeah. But can you use, um, can you use unique pointer with placement new? Okay, I, I think I understand. So if you use placement new, you would have to use some kind of special deleter. Let's look let's check out this little thread here, deleter. Stored deleter. It's a callable object, a function call to this object with a single argument with the pointer. So there's default delete. Oh, and here's here's an example of a special deleter. Okay, I think I get this. Like Oh, you would use standard make unique. Okay.
Ah, okay, so this constructs and creates a unique pointer. Huh, this is starting to be something I need to actually have a think about. I kind of need to pause here and come back to this at a, at a later hour and decide on the proper way to delete entities, to create entities, to manage their components and their pointers. Um, it does look like using unique pointer would be a the right way to go here. Definitely. I, it's something I've never really really done um, I guess this would I would need to I would need to make sure standard unique pointer is not something that um, is gonna slow down my compilation too much by adding it to certain files uh, the other option would be to would be to somehow have an entity or the entity component system would know how would would maybe have a deleter for example for each component but that is, hmm, or maybe like a flag that tell that tells you how to delete it. So there's there's many different ways to approach this. Standard unique pointer seems like the most uh, C plus plusy way, but I don't know. I need to think about this a little bit more. So do, uh, great suggestion, Turticus. Great suggestion. Yes, right. Yeah, standard unique pointer health component health equals standard make unique health component. Right, right. Yeah. And then you could set your own deleter for I imagine for that. And um yeah. So what I need to do is investigate what kind of overhead that would introduce and make sure it's not make sure I'm not just killing my compilation speed or killing or like killing performance. Um but also if there's a simpler way I can do it. I don't know. Lots to think about. So I guess that's going to be it for this stream. I'm going to pause my development here, get some lunch, relax. Um, so yeah, what I was trying to accomplish today was to make it so when the player character moved over a tree, he would just eat the tree, just kill the tree right away. Um, and the issue I'm running into here is now that uh, because I've used a operator placement new for all the components, for example, health component, collision component, those kinds of components, um, all of them are using placement new, so there has to be, they have to be deleted in a special way by simply just calling their destructor and not actually deleting the memory. So, yeah. Nice, you're gonna get some pizza, sweet! Alright, so that's it for this stream, hope you learned something, and uh, I'll catch y'all later, next time.